It's an enormous project. It hardly needs to be uh, you know, described as that. It's sort of painfully obvious that it's an enormous project. The power station was continuing to produce power, I think, until about 1983 when it was decommissioned completely. And then it went through this period through a whole series of developers. I think the first one was John Broom, who I think was known for Alton Towers. Now, unfortunately, he took the roof off, stripped out all, all the equipment, and I think took out anything that was valuable um, before he, it sort of fell apart, basically. So the roof came off the boiler house, and really that was the cause of the main sort of degradation of the structural fabric of the building. Fortunately, the two um, switch houses, which are the bits on either side, there's one on the other side, and the turbine holes were still covered, so they were pretty much intact. Um, but it sort of fundamentally changed the building from a, a sort of rather beautiful building to a bit of a shell, frankly. So, and then it went through other developers. There was a Hong Kong developer um, who had it for a long time, who tried all sorts of schemes with different architects. Um, and then it went to Treasury Holdings, an Irish developer. And I remember one scheme, uh, I was on CABE at the time doing a design review where they had a sort of what they were calling an eco-dome with a glass chimney covering the whole site. I mean, completely crazy, was never going to happen. Anyway, Treasury Holdings, you remember 2008 when the last time the um, financial situation got probably worse, maybe worse than it is now, I don't know, as bad. Um, Treasury Holdings went under and uh, their interests, like a number of other um, projects and buildings and sites, came under the control of NAMA, the um, sort of Irish um, sort of rescue bank, I suppose you'd call it. And then the Malaysians stepped in and bought it. I think they paid 400 million for the, for the site and took over the project. And I think what they did rather cleverly and by this time, I think Treasury Holdings had got a master plan by Vinoli, which actually had outlined planning consent. And um, the Malaysians, which was really a consortium of, of three groups, so two development companies, uh, Syme Darby and Setia, and then a employer's provident pension fund. They sensibly decided not to start again, but to adapt, work with the master plan and move it forward fr from that. So in a way, where the buildings are and what is happening is basically in accordance with the master plan. So they got on with phase one, which is this here. So this is Ian Simpson and DRMM did housing on the other side. Now Wilkinson Air, we were, we arrived at just the right time, I have to say. This doesn't always happen. Um, I, I could think of many times when it didn't for us, but actually we, we arrived at the right time. I had been working on um, the Bodleian, the new Bodleian Library in Oxford, now the Western Library, which is a Giles Gilbert Scott building, which we adapted from being basically a, a book storage building to a library for special collections. So I had sort of got quite interested in Giles Gilbert Scott and I could at least pretend to be knowledgeable about it. And I think that might have helped. So we, we were asked to compete, I think, with about two or three other, maybe three other architects, I can't remember who they were. Um, we didn't have to do very much, actually, to win this project. It was just a few drawings, a few sketched ideas, and a general sort of attitude to the building. And really what we were saying was that this is an enormous volume, and we need to keep the sort of, you know, every time you walk into this building, you need to know that you're in a, let's say, a historic building. You need to be in touch with the fabric. It would be too easy to fill up that volume with accommodation right to the edges, insulate it all, line it all out, and you would hardly know what you were in. Um, and we also said you really need to carve out some big spaces on entry so that people you know, it's such an impressive building on the outside from the sheer scale of it, but you don't want to lose that the moment that you walk in. I'll just talk a little bit about what we've done on the outside. Well, first of all, there's a sort of what they call a halo road that runs around the whole of the power station. So in a sense, that kind of defines our zone. We, we haven't done anything outside that except some involvement in the park here. And this park goes down to the river. Below that park is an absolutely enormous basement, which is the energy centre, 
for it's not just the energy center for this it's the energy center for the entire development and the future parts of the development which go way off over that direction so we're we're focused pretty much entirely on the power station so just a, a, a few words on it the basic sort of volumes of it were set in in the outline planning consent so the fact that there would be these quite glassy volumes on top of new build on the top that they would be fairly plain that was kind of set so we haven't changed that of course we've detailed it we've done all the design but actually it was kind of set I, I, I was happy with that I think it works quite well it needed to be quite sort of simple I think rather than sort of heavily articulated on those levels you've got the boiler house in the middle which is the big volume and then you've got a switch house on either side between the switch house and the boiler house are the turbine halls and then up on the top obviously the new development which is made basically residential on the top and the building works on a series of layers there's three layers of retail effectively of which the first two are basically shops and the third one which is not open yet will be a, an enormous food hall about 24,000 square foot food hall which takes up most of the central area of the of, of that of that space the building was built in two phases so the pre-war phase is is this side basically so it would have had two chimneys and then more or less halfway down the middle it's slightly actually off center the second half was built I think it was started during the second world war but completed after and you'll see when you go in there are two very different architectural approaches they have there are, there is commonality but it's a different aesthetic in a sense I think there's something like nine million bricks in this building and we've had to find something like one and a half million bricks um, in order to patch it up to to do repairs etc um, we had to find uh, bricks from the original suppliers which was possible so I think some of them are kind of Rio we were able to get bricks and actually there are two different types of bricks there's the bricks on this side are slightly different from the bricks on the other side they're even a slightly different size actually now one of the things about this building before was that there were very few windows in it because it didn't really need windows um, so what we suggested and I guess it is something we'd learned from our work on the Bodleian was that Giles Gilbert Scott is very fond of these multiple verticals these sort of almost like rows of soldiers windows or even the decoration this banding you see you could see it again and again in his work and it seemed to us the best way to introduce windows was to do that same thing so we've done it here there were some windows on the switch houses at lower level but the boil house didn't have any windows the central bit up the top in fact it didn't even have a wall that particular this particular side so we introduced um, we introduced a series of windows sort of soldier-like windows all the way along both sides um, and then in some instances where it's complete where there never was a window we've done them in a slightly different way the chimneys um, because of the uh, the gases these these towers this brick tower on the end there are four of these towers four chimneys those are the wash towers so they were basically washing the gases um, from the generating the electricity and I think they used to fill them up with um, wooden pallets or wood basically and the wood would take the sort of toxic stuff out of the gases but that also had what was in the gases had a detrimental effect on the concrete in the chimneys so the chimneys had got to the point where you couldn't really repair them they were beyond repair or if you did repair them it would not have a long enough design life so it was agreed that the chimneys could be rebuilt but they had to be rebuilt in exactly the same way that they were built originally um, which is quite a challenge actually so they were sort of literally taking barriers of concrete up there and doing you can you can pretty much see the port the, the lifts on each each pour um, and so they rebuilt them they had to do one to start with so they took one down this was a planning restriction took one down started rebuilding it once I think the planners and the heritage people were convinced it was going to happen they allowed them to do the other ones as well the big worry was that you'd have Battersea power station with no chimneys which might save 50 million but you also lose your icon <laughs> We have changed the relationship between 
ground and this band that, that runs around. And the reason for that really is you, if you came from the tube station, you'd have noticed that, well, if, depending on exactly which way you came, you can approach this building on two different levels. So the, in order to get the retail to work, you need people to not really know which level they're on, to be able to, they're in a sense interchangeable. Um, and there's an awful lot of accommodation to, to get in into this building and to get it to work so that you could come in on the upper level or the lower level. And you'll see at the other end when we get there, you enter from the upper level. Um, now this, this was the director's entrance to the, um, to the power station. These doors, which look like they've come from a North American skyscraper, basically the reason they look like that is because whoever designed them just took a design that was used in, in North America. So it's, I don't think it was actually, that design was actually generated specifically for, for this. But they do have a sort, of, a sort of charm to them. Let's go in. This space, we found um, that there were miss missing bits of, uh, of the marble wall lining in here that we had to try and replace. And it was quite difficult to find something that matched, but eventually we managed to track down where it had come from and get that quarry reopened in order to, uh, <laughs> to match up. Um, and uh, you've got to study pretty carefully to work out which of these panels is new. I think they, you know, they've done pretty well on this. Electricity was something of a novelty in the 1930s. The idea of the centralization of, uh, of the power generation. You know, I think they were really celebrating the idea that electricity for all. Um, and they kind of went to town in terms of the, the, the elaborate nature of, 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 of what's here. And this phenomenal amount of equipment that, uh, that is here, all controlled from a desk in the middle. Um, and this space has been very heavily restored by specialists, an outfit called Lucas, who've done, pretty much done all the, um, the, the contract work on it. It was in pretty good shape on the whole. It didn't have all of these, these glazed roof lights here were actually um, blocked up, blanked over, because of the, they were seen as a potential target for, or guide for German bombers in the Second World War. So this restoration is the first time this has been daylit, you know, as originally intended um, by Giles Gilbert Scott. Um, and it was in, you know, reasonably good condition. This is the original floor. Um, it's had some repairs, but it's in amazingly good condition. And then a lot of the dials and things have had to be um, just smartened up and restored. Where things were missing, things have been, you know, occasionally you might find one that's, it's been 3D printed to, as a sort of exact replica of what was there. Sometimes nothing, like, you know, everything was missing, so we kind of leave it on a panel like that. Um, I think we all love the names that they use, like Standby Exciter <laughs> or uh, this one. Actually, this one's quite interesting because I think Carnaby Street 2, if I remember rightly, is Buckingham Palace. Carnaby Street 3, we think, is the Houses of Parliament. Um, and I think most of the other ones are what they say they are. The glazing here, this was all original glazing and was actually incredibly good condition, still quite robust. So it's just been sort of cleaned up. You'll see that there, it's actually double glazed because of the noise, basically coming from the, uh, the turbines in Turbine Hall A. So we've just done sort of fairly light restoration to, to that. This is Malaysia Square, so it, for obvious reasons it's called Malaysia Square, not that it looks Malaysian, but it's uh, in, in reference to our, our client. And it is, I, I think officially it gets referred to as a big design. Um, actually there was a competition that was run for the design of this square, and there were two designs that were oval, one of which was ours and one of which was big. So what you actually get is a kind of merge of... <laughs> of two designs. I think I give credit to Big for the, for the, the layering of different coloured granites, but I can assure you these are Wilkinson Air bridges. <laughs> We're at the lower level, or lower ground as they call it. Um, these end walls of the boiler house were um, pretty unstable. 
and had uh, a lot of temporary steel work. So we had to find a way of restraining the brick walls. You know, obviously we wanted to keep the brickwork, any kind of distress or decay, but there's not so much on this particular wall. You can see a bit of paint and so on there. And we came up with the idea of using these wind trusses that you would more, more normally see on a glass wall. Of course, glass walls are designed to, to move or allow movement. Um, we can't afford to allow movement on a brick wall, but I just rather like the sort of lightness of, the, of these sort of spidery trusses and then seeing up to the chimneys. And this is one of the things at the competition stage we were very keen on. You could walk in the building, you could still see a chimney. Um, here, looking at this way, that, where it says Welcome to Bassey Power Station, that will be um, basically Apple's frontage and entrance. It's very unusual in this country, and I mean, maybe even unique, in Asia, it's completely different. They quite happily have entrances to offices within retail shopping environments. Here, I don't think it happened. I don't know if it happens anywhere else, but this Apple were very happy to do it. Um, we'll, go, we'll go up here and then across into the um, turbine hall. Though you can see what level we're at, the darker blue tiles. Um, it was sort of pretty bashed about. Um, so effectively, we've, it went down further than that. There are another two levels of basement below what you see there. Also, originally, all sorts of sort of, um, you know, means of moving water about and various other things, you know, because they took water from the river for cooling. In any kind of retail environment, there's a lot of pressure from the retailers that want their shop fronts to be highly visible. But we were absolutely adamant and, and, and pushed back against any advice to the contrary, saying that we want the shop fronts to, to read as their own little structures, a little intervention that comes in. They need to be set back behind the pilasters and just do something different with the signage. So each of these is a sort of, I think, rather nicely detailed portal. Um, and they're only allowed to have their, uh, their names behind the glass. As we go. So this space, as you can see, very, very different. We had to replace the roof. Above that roof is a, is a garden. There's a, you know, it's a big garden with a lot of planting and um, designed by Andy Sturgeon. And that garden relates to the residences and also to Apple's offices in part. And the, this ceiling, there were some very heavy concrete, um, precast concrete tiles effectively of, on that module suspended off steel trusses. We ended up having to replace those because there was just too much weight. Um, and effectively, we, uh, you know, we had to completely strengthen it. Where you see these circles of light, those were originally just vents. There was no daylight in this space at all. And what we've done is create these um, sun tubes that come up in the gardens. Um, and they're actually just providing enough, just enough daylight to, to lighten the space a little bit. And then here for the crane, we had this idea of, it. well, we called it the bandstand. Um, we just felt you needed an object in the space. It needed to be something. And they've got this with, uh, they sometimes use it for promotion. So promoting themselves at the moment, but, uh, and it docks on to the walkway there. And actually it can be, it, it can go, it can be dropped down to the floor. So let's just walk along here. And then I think we'll, we'll be pretty much done.